Mr. Zaman and today I'm going to bring to you the most important guideline update and statements which have come in the recent conference of European Society of Cardiology which was held in Amsterdam from 25th to 28th August 2023. ESC EACDS statement on the 2022 joint ESC EACDS review of the 2018 guideline recommendations on the revascularization of left main coronary artery disease in patients at low surgical risk and anatomy suitable for percutaneous coronary intervention or coronary artery bypass surgery. The European Society of Cardiology and the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery or EACTS have collaborated on reviewing the evidence for the treatment of low surgical risk patients with left main coronary artery disease. The review, authored by a panel chaired by Professors Robert Byrne and Stephen Frems, was published in the European Heart Journal and the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. The experts group's conclusion after a comprehensive review of all relevant evidence is that for low surgical risk patients, both coronary artery bypass surgery or CABG and percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI are clinically reasonable based on patient preference, available expertise and local operator volume. They have advised that in future guidelines, the class of recommendation and level of evidence for CABG should be class 1 and level of evidence A, whilst for PCI, it should be class 2A and level of evidence A. Their report and associated materials are now being considered by the task force working on a new guideline for chronic coronary syndromes scheduled for publication in August 2024. Until then, the ESC and ESCTS believe that local heart teams should consider both the current 2018 guidelines and the findings of the expert group when discussing the management of patients with stable coronary artery disease. First International Guidelines on Heart Muscle Diseases the European Society of Cardiology guidelines on cardiomyopathies are published online recently in European Heart Journal. This is the first international guideline document to include all cardiomyopathy subtypes and the first time that specific recommendations are made for cardiomyopathies other than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The guidelines highlight the many areas of diagnosis and management that are shared across cardiomyopathy subtypes and give specific recommendations for each. Diagnosis starts with a description of how the heart looks and behaves, is it thickened, dilated or scarred and is the pumping function abnormal and then incorporates information on heart rhythm abnormalities, family history and genetic testing to arrive at a more precise diagnosis. Cardiomyopathy should be considered as the potential cause of other conditions such as heart failure. The diagnosis of an inherited cardiomyopathy may lead to exclusion from cooperative sports and effective decisions about having children. Some patients must live with a small risk of sudden death or the possibility of a future heart transplantation. An implantable cardioverter defibrillator or ICD may be advised to prevent sudden death. The guidelines recommend genetic counselling to support patients and their relatives understand and adapt to the diagnosis of a genetic disease. It should be offered before a decision to test is made and when the results are returned to the patient and their family. In addition, clinical psychological support should be offered to all patients who have undergone ICD implantation or who have a family history of sudden cardiac death. For all cardiomyopathies, management aims to identify and treat symptoms, prevent complications and screen at-risk relatives. Identifying those at increased risk of sudden death is a major focus of these guidelines. Shared decision-making is advised when selecting certain treatments such as ICDs. Other treatments include drugs to address symptoms and heart transplantation. Many subtypes are inherited in an autosomal dominant way, meaning that offspring have a 50% chance of inheriting the mutation. When such a mutation is found, testing of relatives can be considered. A dedicated section of the guidelines provides advice for patients on living with a cardiomyopathy. This includes exercise, diet, alcohol, weight, reproductive issues, sexual activity, medication, vaccination, driving, employment, holidays and travel insurance and life insurance. These guidelines recommend regular low to moderate intensity exercise for all patients with cardiomyopathy who are able to do so. 
an individualized risk assessment should be performed so that an exercise prescription can be provided taking into account the prevention of life threatening arrhythmias during exercise symptom management to allow sports and preventing sports induced progression of the disease patients with certain cardiomyopathies should avoid very high intensity or competitive sports The guidelines recommend a multidisciplinary approach to patient care and timely and adequate preparation for transition of care from pediatric to adult cardiomyopathy services. They emphasize the need for integrated care between specialist cardiomyopathy teams and other professionals including cardiologists, geneticists, genetic counselors, pathologists and other specialties as well as close interactions between primary, secondary and tertiary care. Focused update of ESC heart failure guidelines. A focused update of the European Society of Cardiology Heart Failure Guidelines is published online in European Heart Journal following the results of major new trials that should change the management of patients with heart failure. Chronic heart failure is a condition in which the heart can no longer pump blood around the body as well as it should. It typically occurs because the heart has become too weak or stiff. Ejection fraction, meaning the proportion of blood that is ejected when the heart pumps, is a measure of cardiac function that is used to categorize the types of chronic heart failure. Acute heart failure is life-threatening and requires urgent treatment. It can be the first manifestation of heart failure but is more often due to an acute deterioration of chronic heart failure regarding chronic heart failure in the 2021 guidelines there were no recommendations on the use of sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as no trials had been conducted in these groups since then the emperor preserved trial and the delivered trial were conducted with the SGLT2 inhibitors empagliflozin and dapagliflozin respectively the focus update it recommends an SGLT2 inhibitor that is dapagliflozin or empagliflozin in patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death the 2021 guidelines emphasize the importance of pre discharge and early post discharge assessment in patients admitted to hospital for an episode of acute heart failure Following that the strong HF trial showed the safety and efficacy of starting oral medical therapy and achieving optimal doses before hospital discharge and in early follow up visits post discharge based on these results the focused update recommends an intensive strategy of initiation and rapid up titration of evidence based treatment before discharge and during frequent and careful follow up visits in the first 6 weeks after hospitalization for heart failure to reduce readmission and mortality The focus update stresses that during follow-up appointments particular attention should be paid to symptoms and signs of congestion blood pressure heart rate nt pro bnp plasma concentrations potassium concentrations and estimated glomerular filtration rate these factors are linked with prognosis and can signal the need for further changes in treatment Turning to comorbidities the focused update provides two new recommendations for the prevention of heart failure in patients with chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes based on the results of the DAPA CKD and EMPA kidney trials and a meta analysis of four trials the focused update recommends SGLT2 inhibitors for patients with chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death The second recommendation follows the Fidelio DKD and Figaro DKD trials and a pooled analysis of the two studies. The focused update recommends the MRA finerone for patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus and chronic kidney disease to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. The second comorbidity addressed in the focused update is iron deficiency. The results of new trials including Iron Man plus meta analysis have led to new recommendations in the focused update. Intravenous iron supplementation is now recommended in iron deficient patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure 
failure with mild reduced ejection fraction to improve symptoms and quality of life and should be considered to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. First, ESC guidelines covering all acute coronary syndromes. The European Society of Cardiology guidelines on acute coronary syndromes are published online recently in European Heart Journal. The document covers the management of unstable angina and all types of acute myocardial infarction. Guideline Task Force Chairperson Professor Robert Burns said, quote unquote, time is critical in acute coronary syndromes. When an artery supplying the heart with blood becomes blocked, the quicker we open the artery and restore flow, the less damage occurs to the heart muscle. Chest pain that lasts for more than 15 minutes and or recurs within one hour should alert the public to contact the emergency medical services immediately, day or night. Other symptoms include sweating, pain in the shoulder or arm, and indigestion. The heart requires a constant supply of blood to function normally. Blood flow can suddenly reduce or stop when a clot forms in an artery supplying the cardiac muscle, and this is known as acute coronary syndrome. The subtypes of acute coronary syndromes are defined according to the severity of blood flow reduction and its consequences, that is unstable angina, when no irreversible cardiac muscle damage occurs, and myocardial infarction, also called heart attack, when there is irreversible loss of muscle. Myocardial infarction can be further divided into complete and partial blockages. The guidelines provide detailed advice on treatment, which includes medications such as blood thinners, anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy. Most patients have a coronary angiogram which uses X-ray images to see the heart's arteries. When an artery supplying the heart is completely blocked, emergency insertion of a stent via a catheter in the wrist should be performed in a specialist center. Patients in geographically remote areas without a specialist center may instead receive an intravenous clot dissolving drug. When there is no complete blockage, treatment options are stent insertion, open chest bypass surgery or medical therapy alone. Long-term management is crucial after an acute coronary syndrome as patients are at increased risk of a repeat event. Management includes medications such as antiplatelets and aggressive control of cholesterol levels. Patients should attend a supervised cardiac rehabilitation program where they will be encouraged to adopt healthy lifestyle changes including increasing activity levels, eating a balanced diet, quitting smoking and taking steps to address psychosocial stress if relevant. The guidelines include a new section on the management of acute coronary syndromes in patients with cancer. Those with cancer have an elevated risk of acute coronary syndromes due to shared risk factors such as smoking types of cancer and treatment with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Rates of cancer continue to increase and better treatments mean that more patients with cancer survive and cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death. Those with active cancer are at high risk of bleeding and the guidelines state that this should be taken into account in decisions about management. The guidelines recommend an invasive strategy, for example angiography and insertion of stent if needed in patients with active cancer and an expected survival of at least 6 months. A temporary interruption of cancer therapy is recommended when it is suspected to be a contributing cause of acute coronary syndrome. Also new is a section on patient perspectives. The guidelines recommend assessing and adhering to individual patient preferences, needs and beliefs and ensuring that patient values are used to inform all clinical decisions. The guidelines also advise including patients in decision making as much as their condition allows and informing them about the risk of adverse events, radiation exposure and alternative options. That's all for today. Stay safe. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe and press the bell icon.